Good afternoon, everyone, once again, and we will officially be starting shortly. Uh, let's just wait for a few more attendees to join us, uh, but we are live and ready to begin, so worry not. Um, we will be starting shortly. My name is Wahiga Mwaura. I'll be the moderator for this session, and I'll be giving you more instructions in the next couple of minutes. Uh, so just bear with us. Um, feel free to, and, and for all our attendees who are joining us, I hope you've come loaded with lots of questions because you won't get a panel like this uh, to tackle a topic like this one. So let's just give them a few more minutes to stream into this virtual room and we will be beginning shortly. Thank you. Well, a very good afternoon from Nairobi, Kenya, and hello to you, whichever part of the world you are joining us from. Let me begin by officially welcoming you to the Africa Health Agenda International Conference 2021 for those who are joining this uh, conference for the first time, and specifically to this panel discussion on rare diseases, the case for inclusion in the dialogue for Africa's advancement towards universal health care sponsored, and this panel is sponsored by Takeda, which is a global research and development driven pharmaceutical company. Now, my name is Wahiga Mwaura. I'm a journalist by profession, the special projects editor at Citizen TV in Nairobi, Kenya, and I will be your moderator for this particular session. Now, we are here to have a conversation about rare diseases in Africa and why they must be included in the dialogue on universal health coverage on this continent. Now, majority of people don't really know what a rare disease is, or they assume that they only affect a very small population of the world, of people worldwide rather. But rare diseases aren't very rare, and we'll unpack all of that in our conversation. Now, just some basic ground rules. Uh, first of all, uh, to all our attendees, please utilize the Q&A feature of this uh, Zoom webinar for your questions. So feel free to post in the Q&A section, uh, and you can also uh, tell us where you are uh, joining this conversation from and your name as well. So please do that and feel free to post the questions as early as now. We will gather them and make sure our panelists uh, uh, are able to address them. In addition, a French interpretation service is available. All you have to do is to click on the globe uh, just there at the, uh, the bar just below uh, where the speakers are, select the French channel, to get those interpretation services. So don't feel left out. 
if uh, French is your first language, a French uh, interpretation service is available. Now, this is a panel discussion I am very excited about, especially because of the type of speakers we have uh, lined up for this uh, discussion. Uh, let me just briefly tell you a bit about them before I'll call the first uh, speaker to make a presentation. Joining us for this uh, panel session will be Dr. Susan Wiesbecker, who's the Global Head of Access to Medicine uh, at Takeda. And she'll be making a presentation on the blueprint for innovative access to healthcare. We also will be joined by Patricia Karani, who's a regional patient advocate, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and she'll be sharing a personal experience with us. Uh, thank you so much, Patricia. Eda Selabasto, founder and chairperson of the Botswana Organization for Rare Diseases. Um, we'll also talk about how rare diseases have affected her family. Uh, and Eda, once again, thank you for coming uh, to share with us during this panel discussion. We will be also getting presentations from Professor Monica Essa, a professor and physician scientist from South Africa. Um, Dr. Priya Balasubramanayim, who's a senior public health scientist uh, at the Public Health Foundation of India. We'll also be making a presentation and Ursula Miles, who is the country head, uh, South, uh, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa for Takeda. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a power packed panel to put it lightly, and we look forward to hearing uh, what each of them will have to say. Now we've seen a lot of African countries allocate their attention and their resources to infectious diseases and more recently to non-communicable diseases like cancer and diabetes. That's been a, a big talking point in the continent, especially over the last uh, 10 years or so. But Takeda's flagship blueprint for innovative access to healthcare framework has actually seen particular success in its launch here in Kenya. And to take us through that program a bit better, let me introduce Dr. Susan Wiesbecker, who's a global head of access to medicines at Takeda, who will make that presentation and also set the scene when it comes to tackling the barriers for access in the rare disease space. Dr. Wiesbecker, thank you so much for being a part of this and over to you. Thank you very much, Wahiga, for that great introduction. And I'm, I'm feeling very honored to be here with all the other female panelists. So still in the sense and light of the International Women's Day, I'm very proud to have our, my co-female conspirators on that panel. So, and as you mentioned, um, Wahiga, so I wanted to share and start our discussion with looking at um, how can we drive impact for rare diseases? I hope you can see my slides. So if yes, we, we can. Look, thank you. If we look at rare diseases, and you mentioned it while you go, rare diseases are not so rare as, as we might think. And these are now numbers overall um, across the globe. So we have about 10% of the global population affected by rare diseases, but only less than 5% have a chance of treatment. And again, it's a global statistics, meaning if you're looking from an Africa perspective, it might be or will be even lower. We have an average time diagnosis for around seven years, and it's quite a detrimental impact that rare diseases have. Um, also on um, children, because 30% of them die before their fifth birthday. So, and why it's so important to not just look at the statistics and say we, we need to provide access to the product, because rare disease is also complex. We need to consider the entire ecosystem. And that's also where we at Takeda have a very comprehensive approach to access to medicines. So what we are aiming for is providing access to innovative products for the complex and rare diseases. And we truly believe we can do so much better and driving much higher impact by working together with partners on the ground and together other international partners. So overall having this collective action to really build health systems, so not just providing access to the treatment, but strengthening the health systems so that over time we can help evolving health systems towards a higher bet and better standard of care. So that will also make then um, our efforts much more sustainable if we act as partners, uh, as a group towards improving access to, to care at each stage of the patient journey. 
So for us, that comprehensive view in a partnership is what is also at the heart of our Blueprint project. And Wahiga, you mentioned that already. So while the Blueprint project is, is on cancer care, it's, I believe, a true blueprint when we also look on more rare and complex diseases. So what did we do in the Blueprint project? We brought together different partners along each stage of the patient journey in cancer care. And um, we selected Meru County as a, a pilot county to really show how we as partners and each of us addressing one access barrier along the patient journey can drive synergies across our um, activities to really bring cancer care to the next level, to provide access to, to diagnosis, to, to increase awareness and di increase diagnosis and literally allow for broader access and um, driving also higher or better outcomes for patients. So what we, what we aim to do really is seeing that there is not just treatment um, rates or prescriptions and access to treatment increasing, but also seeing over time how we are able to identify patients at an earlier stage in their disease. So ultimately we aim to drive and to measure the impact we are, we are about to, um, to have on the entire health system. And that's what we also, why we have the impact framework. And I'm highlighting that because it's so important in, in our debate with the many partners to really develop and focus on having and generating proof points that help us to learn or to, to provide evidence that our approach is having um, effect on the health system. So we are working there with Duke University as NGO, which is called Innovations in Healthcare. And we um, supported them in developing an access to health framework that's now being owned by Innovations in Healthcare and that we apply also and pressure tested at the um, access to health global coalition. So overall, the aim is here literally to set an industry standard that we can all fall back to, rely to, upon to, to drive and have a neutral and an objective standard on how well we are doing of highlighting what we can do better. So it, it will help us feeling accountable, but it also will help us to identify where we have synergies and where we can work together. So again, it, it, is, it has some complexity, but I believe we need to upskill us, the partners, every one of us to be able to literally show along the patient's journey from awareness and prevention down to patient support, how we can actually move from our productive tech activities to drive outputs like training physicians, and then seeing the outcome of um, having a higher standard of care or longer treatment duration, and then moving towards impact when we eventually see that we diagnose patients earlier and can also evaluate the broader impact on the health system. So overall, that was um, my, my brief introduction towards rare diseases, the importance of it, but also the importance of a shared accountability for us acting on rare diseases. Because I believe we, we learned during the pandemic that we, in a partnership, can achieve so much more, in particular on health challenges that seems to be uh, beyond us to, to manage and to tackle. And if we learned anything during COVID, I believe that there is a real chance if we keep that um, openness towards partnerships to really make a difference, uh, not just in the long term, but also already in the midterm. So back to you, Vaihaiga, and Thank to continue so our debates. Thank you so much, Dr. Willis Becker. Very illuminating. You've uh, man managed to capture quite a bit in a very short time. You've given us some numbers, 10% affected, 5% have little access to treatment. You've uh, painted for us a picture of that blueprint for innovative access to healthcare and why partnerships are important. If there's anything that COVID-19 taught us, we cannot work alone. We must synergize across regions, across the world uh, for us to make any real impact. Thank you so much. And I'm sure there are questions for you 
uh, doc that uh, we will uh, uh, send you away a bit later on. But let's talk a little bit more about the patient's journey now that we've gotten the big picture. The patient's journey for rare diseases in low and middle income countries is often long and circuitous in nature. Patients are facing various challenges ranging from uh, you know, and affordability to years of several misdiagnoses. And these are stories we've heard over and over again. I now want us to have a deeper conversation about the patient's journey and hear from a patient who has faced several challenges along her way. And let me introduce her this time, Patricia Karani, who's a regional patient advocate based in Kenya. And she'll be sharing a little bit about hereditary angioedema. Patricia, thank you so much, uh, you know, for just uh, sharing your story with us and, and being vulnerable in a forum like this. I want to first begin uh, for the benefit of our attendees who may not be very familiar with hereditary angioedema. Briefly, what is it about exactly? Thank you very much, Wahiga Mora. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, so in a nutshell, hereditary angioedema is a genetic uh, blood disorder that is caused by a deficiency or a dif dysfunctional protein in the body called C1 inhibitor. And uh, it normally manifests in, in massive progressive swellings that can take up to five days to resolve. In a nutshell, that's what it is. Okay, F thank you for capturing that. And, and you know, what are you able to tell us about your particular journey from the initial moment that you developed some of those symptoms to eventual diagnosis? So my journey has been very difficult because it took a long time uh, before I got diagnosis since my first uh, swelling attack that happened about uh, when I was eight years old there about, uh, where I got a swelling on my forehead and uh, nothing much was uh, known about that. But uh, later on, uh, when I was about 18 years old, that is 10 years later, I met a doctor in a hospital who told me that this is called angioneurotic edema. And the next thing he told me is that it has no cure. We just learned to manage it. Um, uh, it became another journey whereby af even after a name was given to my condition, I was still not put on the proper medication. So I suffered the severity of the condition up to the time when uh, I came to learn through other members of my family as well who have the condition that it's actually called hereditary angioedema and there are good ways of managing it and there are local medications that could be available in the country. And then that is where now I started trying to get the locally available medications, which was not easy because I had to convince doctors to give me a prescription, which was another uh, very tedious uh, journey because mm. here I am as a patient, I have the, the name of the condition, but they still want to do tests on me. And you know, there's a lot of misdiagnosis in the process, there's underdiagnosis. So it has been a difficult journey that has been marred with a lot of fear and trauma. And I can imagine the sort of social and emotional challenges that you faced, uh, Patricia. Are you able to mention maybe one key, either social or emotional challenge that, ha that has really stood out? And you've already mentioned some already, but just to refresh your memory. Well, I think one of the greatest that I face up to now is stigmatization and discrimination. Uh, all the way from when I was young, I'm not somebody who wanted a lot of attention, but you know, attention had to be drawn to me because I had something that nobody knew what it was. No doctor wants to diagnose it. Nobody, you know, uh, is familiar with it. So uh, in the workplace, for example, when I reached the workplace, um, I would get sick every Monday. And you know, they used to wonder, why is she sick every Monday? Is she drunk? Does she go out partying? You know, and you know, you get all these labels which are not fair to me, where you're labeled as a lazy person, you're an attention seeker, and you know, you lose friends and you make enemies. So those are some, that, I would say that that is something that still happens up to now, where when you try and explain uh, what you're going through, and yet at times these swellings are internal, you can't explain something external. I mean, you can't explain to somebody something that is internal and they can't see a swelling inside my body. So this actually affected my mental health. And at times I would wonder to the extent whereby it, is it worth living? 
Is this really mm. worth living? Because either way, I will still swell. If I get rid of all the triggers for my swelling, I will still swell. So it really affected my mental health. And, uh, and uh, you know, it proved to be a very uh, debilitating condition for me. Patricia, your words today are powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. I believe the attendees who are listening and getting empowered you know, by what you've had to say. Um, let me engage Edda, but I'll also come back to you because I do have one more question for you. But talking about the patient's journey to treatment, it involves more than just the patient. And patients bear the cost of medical treatment out of pocket, which can be financially catastrophic for them and their families as well. And this is when I want to bring in Edda Salabasto, who's the founder and chairperson of the Botswana Organization for Rare Diseases. Edda, once again, thank you for making time for us. I want to hear from you on what your experience has been like, especially for you and your family, as you care for two children living with a rare disease. Uh, thank you very much, Wahega. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to share uh, our journey. Well, it has been difficult, uh, confusing, painful, shocking, and most importantly, disappointing. Coming from a country where it's attested that health is free for all, then you get this kind of um, diagnosis for rare conditions, and then you realize that you are not among the all. So that is where the, the huge disappointment is for some of us with children with rare diseases, because it's something that you are never prepared for. You know that when you have a headache, you go to the hospital, you get um, the rightful treatment, but then you get a diagnosis for your child. There is a treatment that is available. And then voila, you are told, no, this one, we are not going to be able to support your child. So I have two kids, um, one with a kidney condition, which has not yet been diagnosed. Uh, the doctors were only able to determine that he had very small kidneys, which they say they are hypoplastic. So he had kidney failure at six years old. And we were fortunate that um, I was a match to give him a kidney. So at seven years old, he had a kidney transplant. Now he's 12 years old and he is doing much better. Uh, our daughter has Mokyo A. The journey to diagnosis, uh, we had to do to work and fund it ourselves. We sent her blood samples to Manchester NHS lab. That is when we managed to do the genetic tests and get her diagnosis. So um, basically it is, it is difficult to be in Africa because uh, when it comes to diagnostics, the whole of the continent, we are very much challenged to get diagnosis for most of these rare diseases. And, and Edda, once again, thank you so much for, for opening up. You've alluded to the challenges of navigating the healthcare system. Um, is there, would you be able to say that over the last five, 10 years, you've seen an improvement or do you feel that generally that is a huge gap uh, that you would find either in your country or maybe in other countries across the continent? Has there been any improvement or is the situation still the same? Uh, it's very difficult in Africa and the, the improvement is, is very much slow. Uh, I, I would give examples where I would have parents from other parts of Africa who are even more unfortunate because they are countries they don't have patient advocacy organizations. So they would be going all over the world to try to get an understanding and the heads and tails of what they are dealing with. And uh, I would say progress is very slow and progress is not going to be any faster until uh, at the AU level and trickling down to our countries, we have strategies that pin down to the issues of rare diseases. Because as we look at the AU agenda, there's nothing that talks about rare diseases. And when you come to other conditions at such a level and even at our regions, they are able to pull resources together for other conditions and do this. So it would be a good thing for rare diseases, especially that um, you would find a single patient for a certain condition in one country. When these resources are pulled at a continental level, it would help us a lot and enable us to deal with them. 
Indeed, and, uh, there's that word partnership, collaboration, really coming up again in this uh, conversation. Uh, this is a question to both you, Ed and Patricia, and maybe I can, I can start with you, Patricia. As you draw and reflect on your experience uh, this evening, having walked this journey as a, as a patient, uh, and for you, Edda, as a caregiver, what changes would the both of you like to see that would address many of the obstacles you faced from diagnosis to treatment? Patricia, let me start with you on that one. What changes would you like to see? Thank you, Ahiga. Um, I think I would really want to see a better and improved health system uh, that is championed by the government where well, we have doctors who are specialists or doctors are given incentives to become specialists to venture into rare diseases. I would also want to see a health system whereby the government sets aside money to do research on these rare diseases because they are considered rare uh, because of the, the, the prevalence. And um, also, uh, I would really want a situation where a patient is able to afford the medication. Some of these modern uh, medications are very expensive for some of us patients. We cannot afford. And when we go to the National Health Insurance Fund, they tell you they can't cover it. When you go to the universal health care, they, they tell you we don't have funds for it. So I would want to see a government that is thinking of patients in totality and also uh, emphasis, a very important emphasis, especially for me as a patient, on coming on, um, you know, spearheading patient support groups for these rare patients who at times really need psychosocial support. Okay, and, and Edda, how do you respond to that question? What more can be done from diagnosis to treatment? Well, uh, to be able to fully manage rare diseases like any other diseases, there have to be uh, instruments in place that guide on the how and how you invest in that because there's the, the, so, so much lacking on investing towards rare diseases. First, uh, a UN resolution on people living with rare diseases is very much critical, which would then translate in the WHO um, heading and actually supporting countries on what to do with the right diseases, because most of the time you'll find that they, they, they really don't know what to do. And then at the AU level, as I have said, I would like to see a health agenda at continental level that speaks to rare diseases, because we have experienced it that these generalized uh, strategies that just say health for all, they don't mean us. They mean people that don't have rare diseases. Therefore, we wanted to come out clearly spelt it out that this is how we are going to deal with the rare diseases as the African Union. Uh, coming down to my country, it's, uh, I was surprised. I never knew it, that health is not a human right in Botswana. When you look at our constitution, it doesn't capture health as a human right. Therefore, uh, there, there are some people who are in positions where they, they can be able to make decision to actually make sure that um, health um, for rare disease patient is taken care of. They look at such and they use them as loopholes to not be able to, to, to help you. So I need our constitution to be reviewed and state that health is a, hum is a human right in Botswana. Even M. Botswana has the right to health. Uh, the other thing that I... I would definitely want, because we are yet to develop a universal health coverage strategy. I want that out to come out clearly also, an inclusion of how we are dealing with rare, rare diseases. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, that collaboration, uh, it cannot be thrown out the window that as a continent, we need to collaborate. These are expensive conditions. For example, my child's uh, treatment, enzyme replacement therapy that she needs for life, it's about 4.5 million pula annually for life. And where do I get that as a parent? That is more than $400,000 every year. My government won't, allow, won't pay for that. My medical aid does not pay for that. Uh, so where does that leave us? I had my baby, she was well and healthy mm -hmm. when you looked at her with the eye. Right now she's on a wheelchair from somebody who was able to walk. For her, it is so traumatizing each and every year. She asks difficult questions. 
as she gets to understand herself, her environment, mm. and the challenges that are imposed on her because of her condition. She's very sharp at school. Therefore, I employ the leaders in Africa to tell them that a rare disease patient is also worthy of life. This is something that they, the health ministers in this continent need to take up as a red flag on that dashboard. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you so much, Patricia Karani, Edda Salabasto. I think the key message I'm hearing from both of you is inclusivity. When governments look at healthcare, when they look at the needs of their citizens, can they be more inclusive in terms of how they uh, allocate resources? You've also called for a continental approach. The African Union needs to look more into this uh, and collaboration is the word that, and partnership, I think is the words, are the words that we keep hearing in this discussion. And, and once again, Ed and Patricia, thank you so much for uh, opening up. I know we've barely scratched the surface, uh, but maybe uh, we'll be able to engage a bit more later on at the tail end with the Q&A session. But, you know, having heard about uh, one or two rare diseases in particular at this moment, there are more than actually 6,000 rare diseases worldwide. Uh, and that was actually news to me. With many patients facing similar challenges along the patient pathway to accessing the treatments they need. And I think having listened to Patricia and Edda, we now have a better picture of what that journey could look like depending on which country you are in and, how, and what sort of resources you have access to. But at this time, I want to call upon Professor Monica Esser to come and talk a little bit about the rare disease, about rare diseases, their diagnosis, understanding them, but also focus on work done on the rare disease registry. Where is Africa with that? What needs to happen? And once you have a rare disease registry in place, how do you ensure that it is actually helpful to those who are facing this challenge? Professor Esser, I can give you a chance now to make your presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Wahiga, and thank you very much to the panel for the session and for Takeda for facilitating and for asking me to speak. Um, I hope you can hear me nicely. Uh, I'm speaking loud. Um, and as I uh, work as a pediatrician and as a pediatric rheumatologist, especially, it took me into the realm very much of uh, rarer diseases. Uh, this also linked up into my more recent and most recent work um, with genetics and molecular medicine, because this is where it took me really into the depths of rare diseases and the more rare diseases. Can you see? I'm trying to advance here. We, we can see. And we can hear you clearly uh, as well. OK, fine. Thank you. So um, apologies. I skipped one ahead here already. But um, just to get to the purpose of this, my task was to introduce to rare diseases, which is done to some extent, is done some of the challenges of diagnosis um, and to understand the burden of this uh, as a collective disease entity, not being so rare, and education, which is absolutely vital to enable patients to access care, education, especially of the healthcare professional. And then to talk briefly on the focus of an importance of a rare disease registry, such as illustrated by a registry on primary immunodeficiency, which we initiated in South Africa, and how this actually has been an instrument to raise awareness, to improve standards, because also you have data with which you can go to healthcare providers and with which you can go to even government level. And this was particularly for primary or genetic immunodeficiencies. And this included, of course, um, the entity of hereditary angioedema, which was a really special one. I'll tell you why. Very briefly, um, famous physician William Harvey already talked about rare diseases as taking us from the beaten paths, from the commoner diseases, and the investigation, especially recognition of rare reforms of disease that really advance the discoveries in medicine. So there is also from a medical and scientific point of view, a special value to investigating rarer diseases. So just to get to the introduction on the first part of the talk, we all know that we have a major cause of death being a communicable, non -communic communicable disease, but non-communicable diseases are rapidly setting the stage to become the leading cause of death, even in Africa. Rare diseases are a subset of the non-communicable diseases and collectively enormously important, but we lack data 
um, to really see, especially in Africa, how prevalent are these diseases? What is the spectrum? Where are the services needed? Here, especially with working with primary immunodeficiencies, um, I've learned that the patient organizations play a critical, really critical role. And one that stands out is the Jeffrey Modell Foundation that I've worked with intensely. And they have really set the stage of raising awareness for immunodeficiencies on a global scale. It's really for me been a, an amazing uh, discovery what a patient organization can do. Our bottom line is that, um, as Edda and uh, Patricia also mentioned, the coverage of rare diseases must be included in some documentation, in some government plan, in some health organization globally for the patients to eventually access medication. This has also been outlined. Collectively, rare diseases are about 7,000 entities or perhaps more. Um, we know that they are predominantly genetic in origin, although not all of them and not all genetic diseases are rare diseases. We know that globally it's a huge population that's affected by rare diseases. And we know that many of them, same as with primary immunodeficiencies, they start in childhood. There are serious diseases frequently. They're chronic, they're progressive, as Edda pointed out. And in Europe, if we take the definition, it's a condition that affects less than one in 2000 persons. To me, that is not that rare actually, but we have trouble in defining the specific entities and it's even more difficult to put them together collectively as a punch bag for getting policies in place. 7,000 in the US reported, but as I said, I think more. So because it's so scattered, same as the subset of genetic immunodeficiencies, there is no unified attack possible or approach to uh, governments or funding. We have mentioned that more than 50% um, appear before childhood, but the tragic figures are that 50% of rare disease patients also die before the age of five years. So here's the urgency. And if you look at the diagnostic delay of 4.8 years, you realize that the vast majority of patients, especially in Africa, in this category, pass away before they get a diagnosis. So they're not diagnosed, so they don't exist. It's an easy one. And for most of them, the FDA approved treatment is lacking. So again, you struggle, even if you're diagnosed, to access the correct treatment. The deficit of awareness of medical scientific knowledge of diagnosis and treatment is prevalent, especially in Africa and especially for rare diseases. But we're trying to focus on something positive. Science is providing some answers and lots of rare diseases in their hundreds now can be diagnosed through a biological sample test. Because 80% or more of them are genetic, they can now access molecular testing, genetic testing, which is definitely becoming more cost effective and available and samples can be shipped more easily. And the creation of registries and research networks definitely helps to improve our knowledge of the natural history, the prevalence and the types of diseases we have and where the biggest need is also for education. So my example are the inherited errors of immunity or the rheumatology is my other field. And here we have nature's experiments. It is an incredible learning curve. Every patient actually teaches me, teaches us something. Because here, not in a laboratory, but actually in nature, a patient shows a defect in the immune system. And from the patient, or from the group of patients that have this, we can then trace back the individual defect. And from that, very frequently, actually comes development of a method of treatment or of even repurposing a drug that we've used in another way. So this entity now includes already more than 400 genetically described defects, and it is estimated at one in 10,000 live births. The prominent clinical phenotype is infection. So in Africa, severe, persistent, unusual recurrent infections are common. So why should anybody think of a PID unless you think about it? but they are also recognized to cause dysregulation, diseases, and cancers. In this group, however, with early diagnosis and treatment, such as, for example, immune globulin replacement, you can achieve near normal life expectancy if you diagnose early before there's organ damage. 
The treatment situation in South Africa and in Africa remains a challenge. In a nutshell, a family history is very important in this entity of diseases. Most of them are genetically determined. They are not as rare as a group as we thought. Children are most commonly affected, but adults also, and often they need an individualized approach. But the first steps to diagnosis for this entity and to many other perhaps rare diseases often are not very expensive. The strongest predictors I mentioned is family history. And we often do not pay attention to that when we take a history from a patient. A patient that repeatedly needs serious forms of antibiotics or is failing to thrive. Simple clues, some of them known congenital defects such as of the heart or an absent thymic shadow. But our call for Africa has been to say at least look at severe, persistent, unusual recurrent infections. This is sort of our algorithm to think further in an HIV negative patient. Why should that patient be having these infections? I just wanted to point out in genetics because I alluded to it because obviously history examination and basic laboratory are essential, but the cost of genetic investigation has just come down dramatically more than the cost of anything else I've ever worked with. So it is actually coming into the realm from being in tens and hundreds of millions of rands to now in the region of a hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it is becoming. But why did even PIDs, a rare disease, not exist until recent times? Because again, people were dying from infections. And now we're seeing survival like in the UK and some other developed countries largely because of control of infections, use of vaccinations, and implementation such as that. But in Africa, you see this is the Mozambique curve, survival is still markedly impaired, mostly because of infectious diseases compared to a country overseas that's got access to more optimal healthcare. And in Africa, now 50% of young children still die from infection. So in Africa, um, this is quite a busy slide. Um, these uh, conditions, primary immunodeficiencies, my example, are also not so rare when they're lumped together. We estimate about 1 million in Africa. And all right, we are approaching 1 billion inhabitants, but 1 million is still a lot of people. Um, the greatest challenge um, is with diagnosis. Awareness is the key factor, especially in central and sub-Saharan regions. Uh, diagnostic facilities are limited, um, but they can be accessed sometimes via those for uh, commoner diseases such as HIV, if we look at lymphocyte counts. Treatment access is very, very limited. Data and register information on PID, as an example, are limited largely to North and South Africa. There is virtually nothing reported from Central Africa. Collaboration is the key, it's been mentioned. Patient support organizations, and here I've had wonderful work with the International Patient Organization for Immunodeficiency. Networking is now becoming feasible, and we've seen this in the last year, and we're doing it right now. We're having conferences at low cost. Emerging societies, I was a co-founder of the African Society for Immunodeficiency in 2008, is a driving force in promoting awareness and also formulating respective guidelines for recognition of these diseases and for treatment. And access to genetics is involving and with the potential of vast diagnostic advancement and even in the future, curative options for rare diseases. And I think this is one of the most exciting things. If we know what the genetic defect is, and we've alluded to this, more than 80% of rare diseases have a genetic cause, then we can potentially in future correct this defect. The diagnostic dilemma, um, these rare diseases often in particular primary immunodeficiencies can be very confounding. This is a very, very rare disease, which is basically like a progressive ossification or bony development of a person where that is a very rare gene defect. It's um, FOP. This has taught me by a patient organization what amazing work can be done to put together patients who basically become cast in stone over their lifetime in their own bone skeleton. And they have mobilized tremendous capacity. So if a very, very rare disease can do this, 
then other rare diseases can be diseases as well. Approach to diagnosis is limited. Um, I've mentioned that, but many of the genetic disorders also have very variable ways of presenting clinically. So again, the clinical recognition is still important, even if you've got good access to a laboratory. And what we're learning with the genetic investigation is we have to look at Africa. Africa is different. We've got one of the vast, one of the most um, diverse genetic landscapes in this whole world, in this whole globe. And this is what we have to keep in mind. And for this, we need our own facts and figures. There are often clues available in the history, simple things to actually get to the diagnosis. And one of the hallmarks of this very rare, strange disease is that these patients in childhood, most of them present in childhood, have deformed big toes. Here it is often just a look at the toes. Why is this toe so strange? Cost versus value. Another one when you get into diagnostics, this is just um, very quickly. Some of this is not expensive. If you look at the cost of these incredibly severe diseases, severe combined immunodeficiency, which basically is um, you know, a disease that is incurable without transplant, but these are very low cost investigations overall. And overall, the diagnostic test has to yield something for the patient to improve the patient's life. Newborn screen is an example. I won't dwell on this. I've just put up the slide for you. So the red disease registry in Africa, what has it taught us? It needs to be locally applicable for our warning signs. And we started this registry in 2008, and we wanted to describe the local spectrum and with it improve services, training, awareness, and the ultimate aim for this is to improve the care of patients. We've got 395 patients on it, it's not many, it's a collaborative effort. But here come the points. When you have data, we can see that even our major population group is black ethnic, this is severely underreported, only 15%. We have a minimum number for 5,000 expected cases. And we also know that all these patients are HIV negative. So it comes out here with a 13% prevalence of HIV. If that patient is negative and having recurrent infections or symptoms, why is this patient not being diagnosed? Respiratory, common as presenting patient and unexplained body swelling actually came up here as well because we had a special interest group, um, a re, you know, a, um, what was it, a research group focusing on people with um, hereditary angioedema. Most of the reporting comes from a single province and a very small proportion from our biggest populated province in South Africa. So again, it shows you where you have to put your resources to get better reporting. We can see that the antibody defect profile is our commoner one, like in Europe. And we can see that complement deficiencies were very prominently represented here. And again, the value of a simple thing, the family history of a disease. This is just a picture which you're probably aware of and the life-threatening disease with Patricia has already described, which can be easily diagnosed actually if there is awareness. Why is there swelling, repeated swelling? What is it due to? A simple screen, if that test can be set up, can be life-saving. So a single registry lesson, there's serious underreporting, where's awareness? The majority ethnic group is underrepresented or missed. If it's HIV negative, then why are the recurrences coming in infections? Respiratory symptoms came out the prominent one. Regional provincial differences, why are other centers not taking care? Diagnostic patterns that might be similar to Europe or USA, but is that applicable to Africa or our Africa? Certain research interest groups can promote a disease um, awareness and treatment. And um, we have a very labor intensive system here for a simple registry even. How can we cause this for further impact? We have to create awareness at multiple levels. I've already alluded to this. Um, we have to use specific slogans, which we've used successfully in South Africa. We need training for PID, but for all rare diseases and the syllabus uh, we have prepared one now for specific training for specialists for this in South Africa. We need dedicated centers of excellence, and I would call those centers of excellence for rare diseases, not just for PID. And we established another one in Gauteng. And we need genetic research centers 
to help us into the future because this is the way to go whether on panels, whole exon sequencing or whole genome sequencing. So these have all been outcomes. We need collaboration in the future. We need data-driven evidence. We need education at every angle and we need access to modern technology. So thank you. I just want to add that in the end, we're talking about patients, not about technology and empathy for rare diseases as for other patients is needed because it's not just about profit, it's about a human life. And we define ourselves as humans by showing empathy. And that includes patients who are suffering from all diseases, but also rare diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Monica Essa, who's a pediatric rheumatologist uh, based in South Africa. Very comprehensive presentation there, just helping us understand why the data matters uh, where we are in terms of that disease registry, uh, some shocking statistics right there, and, and hopefully it will guide our thinking and give us a strong call to action as we look to take this discussion beyond this forum uh, to the world. And really, thanks to everyone who's posting their questions, either in the chat section, although I'd really like you to post in the Q&A section, which is at the bottom of your screens there near the uh, interpretation icon. So please post your questions there as well. We're getting some interesting thoughts from a Christine Mutena who says, one, Africa doesn't have a definition of what a rare disease is. Think about that. But secondly, we don't have, and this is from, still from Christine, we don't have a registry or database in Kenya, something that makes it hard for a patient organization to push any agenda. We're always being asked about our numbers. How many are we? So Africa needs its own definition of what a rare disease is, but also needs a registry, up-to-date, comprehensive, and detailed that can really help uh, uh, those who want to support to understand where the challenges are and how they can plug in. Uh, so thank you so much, Christine. And to all those who have questions, please use the Q&A section of this uh, uh, Zoom webinar to uh, post them there. And uh, we will I'll try and move through very quickly so that we actually have time for questions. Now, COVID-19, we have to mention that word, it's ushered in a new era of digital connectivity, which is transforming the way healthcare is carried out around the world. So we wanna ask ourselves at this time, what lessons can we learn from the digital innovations and new approaches in telemedicine that can be applied to rare diseases? And to help us do this is Dr. Priya, Priya rather, Balasubramaniam, who's a Public Health Foundation of India Director uh, at the uh, Center for Sustainable Health Innovations. Dr. Priya, I can give you a chance now to help us understand how digital innovation can be applied to rare diseases. Um, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Akeda for uh, inviting me to this really interesting panel discussion. Before I begin, I have a confession to make. I am not approaching this as a rare disease expert. I am a public health scientist. And my focus has primarily been on the strengthening of health systems. But more recently, I have been focusing on two things, uh, mixed health system and the role of multiple stakeholders in strengthening capacity gaps within those health systems. And of course, the role of technology uh, in enabling uh, uh, those access uh, uh, questions to be made much easier um, as a result of uh, growing technological advances in many emerging economies. So, my presentation will not focus on rare disease per se, but really on the advent of technology and how some of this can actually be leveraged uh, to make uh, access to rare diseases uh, something of a mainstream rather than an exception. So um, here goes. Uh, we actually began this year, uh, ironically, in 2020 um, with a series of consultations uh, with private sector and diverse stakeholders that really wanted to capture um, how different stakeholders were involved in redesigning health systems for UHT. Uh, part of my presentation will really focus on the impact of COVID-19 and how this has actually changed the way we are approaching and going to approach health systems, um, especially around the global south. Um, and so this series really tried to understand 
different partnership models for health system capacity, governance, um, uh, discussions with parliamentarians, uh, and ultimately the role of evidence in engaging both public and private sector stakeholders in building health system capacity uh, for UHT. Um, and the outcome of this collaboration, and CADA was very much part of this, was uh, actually the creation of a mutual learning platform for shared evidence uh, in multi-stakeholder engagement. So, uh, I mean, countries today face challenges as well as different priorities eliciting from different disease burdens. I'm not an expert on rare diseases, uh, but as Dr. S mentioned, uh, rare diseases are often a subset, they are a subset of non-communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases form a very high disease burden uh, uh, across many countries uh, today. Um, so you have what we call, you know, multiple disease burdens. You have non-communicable diseases that are increasing and within that the subset of rare diseases. You also have unfinished agendas of communicable diseases, maternal and nutritional deficiencies, uh, uh, you know, lack of universal access to primary he health care. And then, of course, over the last one and a half years, COVID-19, which has completely ended uh, health system and rare diseases and NCDs have been one of the biggest uh, uh, areas of, 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 health, of the health sector to really suffer from what we call uh, the, the collateral challenge or the collateral burden of health systems focusing on an infectious disease pandemic and as a result uh, leaving many other areas of the health, health sector largely neglected. So four lessons that COVID-19, I think, forced us to understand uh, is also to give health systems new levels of agility. Um, so there was a unifying purpose uh, of health systems that was on full display. And many governments actually lowered their barriers to risk. When they lowered their barriers to risk uh, as a result of COVID-19, they also encouraged innovations by multiple stakeholders to kind of counter and deal uh, with this new pandemic that was affecting every area of the uh, health system. So risk tolerance has changed almost overnight. Uh, there, was, there was a level of transparency in how governments were beginning to actually enact or bring in different stakeholders. And there was also, I think, a new clarity that is emerging about what work is really uh, essential. You know, where are governments really investing? And, and what are these fault lines that are emerging in country health systems uh, that really need to be plugged? Where do we need new investment? And where does investment need to be repurposed? And at the end of the day, uh, you know, why is public health all the more important to country health systems? Uh, and the achievement of universal health coverage. So in the health sector value chain, you know, uh, there are different providers, there are intermediaries and there are products and there are manufacturers. And one thing that COVID has taught us that disrupting this entire value chain, you have a new set of actors, uh, which I would like to call the fourth estate of health system. And this is technology. You're looking at artificial intelligence, you're looking at telemedicine, you're looking at wearable devices, drones, trackbots, drug delivery, drug discovery, and in that chronic care management, as well as primary health care reference, who will form the bulwark of leveraging uh, uh, disease conditions like rare diseases into the technology space. Um, you know, digital technology has also been recognized at the macro policy level. Uh, WHO recently had guidelines on, you know, how the private sector health uh, delivery continues to grow. And with that is the advent of digital health. And that's really challenging uh, the very way health systems are operating. Uh, it has helped bridge specific health systems gap, gap, but also created opportunities to address many others. So the landscape of health system disruptors is, is, is quite unique and extremely diverse. You, from pharmaceutical supply chains to real world evidence to disease management and therapeutics, screening and diagnostics, you have a plethora of digital devices, networks and platforms that are beginning to come together to be able to address many systems levels capacity gaps. Um, and some of the emerging digital solutions for COVID-19, I believe, offer uh, platforms 
for which rare diseases can also be uh, managed, better screened, and better diagnosed. Um, the first is, of course, the fact that a large proportion of, of technology has now been devoted to surveillance, uh, digital epidemiological surveillance. Uh, there has been rapid case identification in many areas where technology has been used, interruption of community transmission, public communication like never before. I think for the first time, uh, public health communication has taken um, a very big space uh, in the technology area. And finally, clinical care. And within clinical care, one of the areas that technology has attempted uh, to bridge is this collateral damage uh, caused by uh, COVID, which is chronic disease management. And there were two areas of technology that have begun to address that. One is bringing technology to the primary healthcare level value chain. The second is point of care testing and diagnosis. And the third is using technology for screening and research, which forms a very important link to identifying disease paradigms at a very early level. Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, the adoption of telemedicine in a country like India, uh, it, it was quite, a, it's quite interesting because during the period of March and May 2020, uh, the share of clinicians using digital platforms uh, was around 85%. But on the other hand, all teleconsultation services, almost 80% of them were first time users. So what the pandemic has essentially done is has, it has shifted or made societies uh, as well as population bases more comfortable with remote access uh, and remote medicine and, and brought it down to the primary healthcare level. And this could potentially have far reaching implications on how we address primary healthcare screening, how we manage NCD burden and what the, this could eventually imply for rare diseases. Um, this plethora of, of, of digital innovation uh, has also interestingly high policy impact. So in India, with, uh, with the advent of COVID-19, um, uh, the, the country was actually, um, uh, you know, uh, motivated to institute a first digital national health policy. And the creation of this policy included multiple stakeholders, sector, citizen groups, patient groups, as well as the private sector, really look at how interoperable systems could be created to create what is called a continual referral chain from primary to secondary to tertiary. And this digital uh, uh, blueprint forms the first basis of primary healthcare or a reinvestment in primary healthcare that had long been neglected uh, in, in, in India. Um, it also encouraged individual states and provinces within the com uh, country to have a national health policy that included uh, addressing non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and within non-communicable diseases, a subset of, uh, of rare diseases as well. But let's see how this can actually be done and how the current scenario in India could actually shape some of those and whether there are reflections uh, for the African continent. So as of the 1st of March, 24,000 private sector hospitals in India joined the government in administrating vaccines to senior citizens and, but more interestingly, populations with comorbid conditions. How did they do this? So they actually instituted a digital app called COVIN, which is now being uh, administered all over the country, where all citizens are required to register in order to get a vaccine shot. This was actually then merged with the uh, with the Trace Together app, which is a contact tracing app. The two of them were actually merged. And for the private sector partners and other uh, non-state partners to kind of get on uh, with this program, they had to register their patients within the app and also register what kind of conditions that they were declaring. So, you know, whether they were diabetic or hypertensic or had cardiac problems and including whether they had specific diseases including rare conditions. This in many ways in a data paucity uh, led uh, you know, health system like India has the potential to create a database of close to a billion people 
where you have comorbid conditions recorded for the first time in history. Of course, this has larger implications on data privacy and other areas of regulatory uh, interest. But for the first time, you know, there was a digital capture of comorbid conditions that had never been done before. So this is a real time uh, way in which technology is actually being leveraged to screen through populations with rare diseases. The second was the telemedicine model. So India has had several private sector uh, digital entrepreneurial, uh, social entrepreneurship telemedicine models that are now working with uh, states. And what telemedicine has done is really bring down primary health care to the platform of a mobile phone or through a specific hub and spoke model. So this is uh, one example of a company called iCure, uh, which has partnerships with 12 Indian states. They work through a hub and spoke delivery model in peri-urban and rural areas where they provide digital point of care diagnostic as well as hybrid telemedicine consultation. So the potential of including something like rare disease offers a lot of opportunities in this model. Similarly, in the other parts of Asia, COVID-19 has also led to technology innovations. Um, a telemedicine company called Halodoc, which is based out of Indonesia, recently partnered with the Indonesian Social Health Insurance Scheme uh, to create teleconsultations that specifically addressed patients with chronic medical conditions uh, that also manifested symptoms of COVID. So the first time there is this merger of a kind of a, a digital NCD registry at the primary healthcare level that could then be translated into looking at NCD burden as well as subsets of NCD burden in the long run. Gojek is another platform that that uh, that is involved with access to medicine. Interestingly, it is Indonesia's answer to Uber. They partnered with Helodoc to create an access to medicine ecosystem. Um, uh, that would supplement some of the primary uh, health telemedicine initiatives. So what are implications for digital and rare diseases? Uh, from my understanding, rare diseases are multi-systematic, systemic, so they affect all body systems. And individually, they are often present with multi-system factors. So they actually travel all medical special specialties as well as a life course. And because of their individual rarities combined with many layers of common elements, they are uniquely suited to cross-border multi-system healthcare, which can be provided uh, with, with digital health markets. Um, for rare disease partners, this might actually be an opportunity to leverage digital health partners, especially in diagnostic screening, uh, maternal and child health, as well as in respiratory and NCD franchises, and engage into new partnerships with these digital solutions uh, to build and support an ecosystem of digital health uh, solutions that, that kind of extend beyond fighting a pandemic, but also create, you know, user platforms uh, for beyond the pill strategies. Um, so I think digital partners are well suited to move across um, you know, um, health specialty borders uh, and blur some of those borders. Tools that help in chronic disease management and allow care uh, are likely to be highly valued in a post-COVID world. And this is another area where rare disease could, you could actually ride on, on uh, a digital platform. And finally, um, integration at the primary level. So a person's medical journey essentially starts with primary care. And, and so it's increasingly um, you know, needed to embrace the challenges and opportunities of primary care. And digital health integration within primary and specialist care is very, very critical for complex conditions like rare diseases. So investing in primary healthcare digital models uh, like telemedicine uh, could actually involve training of primary healthcare providers pick up rare diseases at the very beginning of maternal and child health cycle. And interestingly, uh, specific digital health examples uh, for rare diseases that have been adapted uh, to serve more common diseases include, you know, um, programs like Life Languages, which was uh, had an initial focus on rare diseases uh, to include development of resources 
uh, for the novel cor coronavirus, so an immunodeficiency. So essentially, uh, this was then adapted as a COVID-19 symptom tracker called COVID Aware Me, uh, which is based on a rare disease patient facing knowledge aggregate, uh, aggregator called Rare Aware Me. So there's already that interchange of uh, a technology that is happening. Um, so overall digital me medicine can address complexities within the current healthcare system by providing enhanced access to information, um, enhancing position of information and improving uh, patient engagement and self-management as well as interface leading to better health outcomes. So I think it's about harnessing multiple digital partnerships where, de where, de where rare diseases can actually fit into those partnerships right at the primary level and include all these different digital data points, whether it's awareness, whether it's treatment seeking, whether it's forming a registry uh, to kind of uh, come together, to create a rare disease ecosystem within the digital space. So there are of course challenges uh, to leveraging digital networks, especially in a continent as diverse as Africa. Uh, and but one of the things that COVID-19 I think has proven is that every country is going to invest more in digital infrastructure. Uh, um, that, that in many ways, technology is going to begin to augment many of these gaps that health systems are simply unable to fulfill. Um, some of the challenges, of course, will include regulatory reform and the fact that policy needs to keep up with digital health growth and innovation. And this includes managing issues around data privacy, technology trans, uh, standards, transparency, and accountable relationship. But countries, more importantly, will need to invest in this. Digital data sources, like any data source, has to be integrated and interoperable. So analysis and use of this data will also depend on digital infrastructure and readiness of a public health system. Uh, again, this involves investment in country-level digital health infrastructure. There is a need for systems level approach for a fit for purpose mixed health system that can integrate and embed different kinds of partnerships with providers. And this will really involve real world data and patient centered metrics. Um, so as uh, the global south and many emerging economies began, begin to embrace digital technology, uh, it's never a one size fit all approach. But luckily technology can also be manipulated to work for what works for specific populations and specific population bases. There's a need for patient engagement and co-design in, in many digital solutions. And these, of course, need to focus on equity and tools that can be employed in low, low resource environments. So for the longest time, you know, infrastructure has often been an obstacle, but technology has kind of uh, adapted low resource environment and that that is going to be seen more in the future and finally no digital technology can operate in isolation and they have to be integrated into existing health systems and communities uh, so whether south africa or singapore uh, in, have successfully introduced contract tracing apps along with india but many of these apps need to be embedded within health systems and used more by communities that function within those health systems. So while digital networks and digital solutions and digital schools will not be the silver bullet answer to any health system solution, they will most certainly be part of the future in argumenting some of these health system capacity gaps. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And uh, we're open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Priya Balasubramaniam, who's a senior public health scientist, uh, Public Health Foundation of India. And uh, I know in the interest of time, she was unable to maybe present everything, but she's just helped us understand digital partnerships in rare diseases, their implications, and of course, what we can learn uh, across different countries and continents to better improve what we are doing here on the African continent. Now, um, as we, in a sense, wrap up our conversation on rare diseases, it's very clear how critical this conversation is from what we've heard. And it, this is why we must continue to raise awareness on rare diseases and ensure that they are integrated in the conversation and policy making towards universal health care and coverage in Africa. 
And just to help us uh, sort of uh, bring this uh, to an end and a call to action, I want to invite Ursula Miles, who's the country head, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa of Takeda. And one of the questions she will answer is what everyone listening in here today, whether you're a policymaker, a healthcare provider, what you can do in your own sphere to advocate for rare diseases and their inclusion in the country's UHC agenda. Ursula, uh, you can now proceed. Thank you, Wahiga, and thank you to all the presenters, but especially um, to Patricia and to Edda for making the patient journey so real for us and helping us to understand this high, the high unmet need um, within rare diseases. So I think it's very clear for us that if when we attend these meetings and we do nothing, nothing is going to happen, right? And a status quo will remain. So therefore, I'd like to summarize and bring you and, and just for you to walk away with some key points after this meeting. In order for us to drive impact, it's about doing it together. We've heard a lot about partnerships today, and part of it is around making sure that we accelerate the diagnostic process. The, the statistics are dismal when you hear about um, death rates before the age of five years. And with slow diagnosis or no diagnosis, we know this is probably even more. Um, engaging and educating governments is going to be really, really important for us. But this also speaks to healthcare workers and the public on early symptom recognition. I think Priya very eloquently um, made us aware of how technology can support and the use of technology can support this. Um, the engagement of government and policy to change policy on rare diseases and have it recognized as part of non-communicable diseases is really important because we do believe that this will enable appropriate treatment and it will also help and support broadening of access. Strengthening public-private partnerships are really important and the work being done by advocacy, by advocacy groups cannot be dismissed. Right, and we've seen also around what Suzanne had presented, the power of partnerships. And this will also help support patients to understand their disease and the need to remove the stigma felt by those affected. We heard this clearly also from our patients. The need for a national disease registry was clearly highlighted and, to, and that will help us to understand the burden of disease. When we talk to governments, but also to support patients and their families, and especially when you look at future planning for the healthcare system. And then finally, I think we, we, we cannot possibly leave this meeting without talking about the call for action. So as we strive towards universal healthcare across Africa, um, we cannot afford for patients and their families who are affected by rare diseases to be left behind. So for those of you, and I've seen many in the chat room that do work within government institutions and that probably um, also work with policy, both in the private sector as well as within government and all stakeholders involved in, in universal healthcare, we have to make sure that rare diseases remain top of mind and that we do look at how we can, how we can enact policy change. And this will enable patients and their families to access life-transforming life treatments. And this will definitely make for a better society and it will improve the care and also the lives of patients and their families living with rare diseases. And I just want to take this opportunity to once again thank the panel, but also the facilitator and also to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you so much. If we were meeting physically, now is when we'd have a big round of applause, Ursula, but unfortunately, uh, a virtual applause is, is what we'll have to leave with. That's Ursula Miles, country head, South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa for Takeda. I think she's wrapped this up very well, uh, but I just want to say that in the comment section, a lot of uh, 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 great messages to the panelists and to uh, Edda and uh, uh, Patricia who shared their story. A lot of people just really appreciating each of you coming to share your knowledge and your personal experiences. And one comment here that I find very interesting as we wrap this up, Bistra Zaleva says, to add to the information that we've received here, can each country have analysis of the policies in place, availability of medicines and treatment, and healthcare workers' knowledge? Often, the um, biomedical companies, including pharmacies, do not, or pharmaceutical companies, rather, do not engage because of perceived lack of market opportunities. Bistra, thank you very much. 
for that important point about what else we should be looking at. Now, as we strive for UHC across Africa, rare disease must not be left behind. We need collaboration. That's been said quite a bit between policymakers, government, private sector, and stakeholders in the UHC community to influence rare disease policy and accelerate access to care and treatment for people living with rare diseases. We certainly hope this session has been helpful to you and that we'll be able to translate the discussion here into action. I want to once again thank all the panelists, thank the attendees, because without you, this would not have been possible. And let me thank once again Takeda and Amref for providing this platform. My name is Wahiga Mwaura. I've been your moderator for today. Thank you so much. And let's go and put into action what we've discussed here today. Uh, we now can conclude this meeting and there is a link that has been put in the chat section for you to join the closing session and awards ceremony. So please do that. Uh, without further ado, thank you. Stay safe and let's continue to champion uh, and ensure uh, that rare diseases uh, are handled the way they should across the African continent. Uh, in Kenya, we say kwaheri, goodbye and thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aiga. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Good night.